Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the incredibly tedious friend who insists on calling it flatbread when it's very clearly pizza, and today it's time for episode 11 of Transistor, and uh, so two things I want to mention really quickly before we start. One, uh, trigger warning for suicide, there, there are characters who have committed suicide later in this episode, and the second thing is that Normally at this point in a playthrough, I would do a poll to see what people are leaning towards as to what I should let's play next. Um, however, I have too many candidates to trim down to a nice convenient Twitter poll, so I think I'm just going to commit to playing Dishonored next. But one thing I would like to know is if people have any opinions one way or the other on whether I should have longer episodes, um, the same length, uh, maybe shorter episodes, or in fact, um, the same length but more of them. So. Yeah, because uh, Dishonored is a little bit longer, potentially, of a game than I would want to commit to a full in-depth Let's Play, but it's one of my favourite games and I have a lot to say about it, so if people would not find longer episodes tedious, uh, then that's definitely an option for me. If not, I'll just use the same the same pattern, but, um, you know, that's why I want to get information on it. Anyway, so um, with that, let's go. Let's go um, have the incredibly obvious giant um, boss fight that's been set up and foreshadowed for the last few hours of gameplay. Hey, something I've been meaning to tell you. Once this is over, maybe there's still time to skip town. Think about it. Standing offer. I like that as we reach this area, the um, Art Deco influence becomes much stronger, flooding out the Art Nouveau influences as we get these kind of sweeping, archetypical, almost platonic forms. Shapes cut down to the meanings they imply rather than any kind of actual Let's detail. Our best. Let's see, I've got two left to unlock on that. Where's it plugged in? install this. You don't get you guys don't need to see this. So as we continue on we find ourselves thinking about the way the art of this game has positioned Grant as this kind of overarching overbearing presence. Um, it uses all of the iconography that a, a game's villain usually has. So I don't really want to comment on or talk about you the extremely common trope of referring to someone who's committed suicide as a coward. I don't think that's a valuable discussion to have right now, and I don't think I'm the person to have it, but I do dislike uh, that framing and positioning, generally speaking. The camarada let these things in. Must like it better here than wherever they come from. So here, um, it's very clear based on what he says that... <laughs> Nobody in the city has any idea what these things are or where they come from, but these things are in fact the fundamental structure of their reality. They're as much a part of this world as electromagnetism is of ours. Once they lost the transistor, they lost control of the process. And a lot of people kind of think about these, this game in a certain way, where they're like, well, how did this society arise? How did it, how did it come into existence like this? And um, I'm going to take a step aside from my usual soapbox, where I just talk endlessly about how, no, you need to understand that metaphor exists, allegory exists. Um, stories are not about the literal details of their logistics, you know? In Star Wars, it doesn't matter what the Clone Wars is, it's just mentioned offhandedly, you know? And that gives a greater sense of texture and depth to its world because it's an event that happened in these characters' histories, but they don't need to explain it to each other and we don't need to know what it is. So stepping aside from that usual soapbox, um, the flaw people think about, <laughs> the flaw people have when they think about how this game world, this game's world works, is that they wonder how this society came into existence. How did it end up like this? Thought they could change the world with this thing. How did this integrated society arise? They were close. Grant went first. Azure followed suit. Didn't want to end up like Sybil. But the answer is simply that this is the nature of their world. Their world is just like this. And I will talk a little bit more about that shortly. So that's it. I couldn't stay to meet with you in 
person. Grant, he couldn't wait any longer. Why, he would leave me? I'd sooner take an eternity in the transistor. But he was no longer seeing straight. Or perhaps he'd decided he'd seen enough. We knew the stakes of what we wanted to accomplish. And we knew that if we were to fail, we would do so together, as one. See you in the country. See you in the country. Uh, before we move on though, what are you gonna I, do now? I do kind of want to just point out that, um, well, this is a game that has queer characters in it. These two are a couple. Sybil is attracted to Red. They all do end up dead, however, I don't necessarily think that's a, uh, an instance of the kind of bury your gaze trope, because everyone in the society dies. This is a tragedy. This is a story about tragic things happening. Um, yeah, let's see what this says. Hey there, remember me? <laughs> Guy you killed the other day? Let me be the first to welcome you to your new home. You fake. Wake up, buddy. Got some questions for you. How do we stop this? Fairview. How are we supposed to get all the way over there? Oh. Oh. Really? Yep, there again is the underlining the of the... There's one left. The underlining of the idea of suicide is inherently cowardly and... I don't think it's a good thing. I think it's a, a bad thing for suicide to exist in the universe. However, I, I think that cowardice is not... I said I wasn't going to get into this. Let's move on. Um, so, yeah, the, the idea of the um, well-meaning people who unleash something with the best of intentions, but that gets out of their control and ends up destroying the very thing they wanted to protect and being unable to live with that is a weirdly common trope, but it's much something much more suited to written works, to literature, to, well, shitty fantasy novels as well, um, than, um, than games, because as always this game and this studio are interested in engaging with those sort of literary concepts, which is one of the reasons why it's such an unusual and such a special studio. the real tragic irony of the Camerata is that they wanted to change their society for what they saw was the better, but the irony there is that what they wanted to change was the city's capacity to change. After all, this is a city that changes constantly, and that constant change is ultimately what the Camerata did not desire for it. So, uh, to go back to what I was saying about um, the kind of, like, position of this story. The mistake people make is thinking about thinking of it as a world like ours, or a world that is recognisably our own, that has then become changed from First that state. We the then we make way for Fairview. Last member of the Camerata will be waiting. That has then been changed into this completely integrated digital society with its um, constant surveillance-based democracy. But that's not the case. As I've said before, 
This is a world that is just like this. This is the equivalent... <laughs> the plot of this game, the narrative of this game, is the equivalent of if you read a fantasy novel... It's sealed up. The whole thing. And the plot of that fantasy novel revolved around a wizard who found the magic artifact through which the world has come into existence, a mechanism by which the world can be chained. Well, I misspoke there, I meant to say changed, but really that's kind of oddly insightful by accident. What a nice uh, surprise. There is no difference between um, the plot of a fantasy novel being about a wizard who has obtained hey, the artifact. You got a full house. Uh, Never get the feeling. Yeah. That lets you rewrite the universe and then Misusing it, losing control of it, unleashing the processes that created the universe in reverse, rendering it back into its fundamental basic state, the original blank canvas from which it was carved. That... that's a plot you would not question. The mechanisms of that, the logistics of that, are not what's relevant. They are not really part of the story. Okay. That's just how it works. That is the nature of that world. So uh, I'm going to climb down back off my secondary soapbox because um, I could keep going on about it, but I feel like you get the point from this stage. And I want to say that one of the interesting things about the process is that they are a process. They are a system. They are part of the fundamental fabric of this world. Hello they are there. how it is constructed and how it came into existence. Maybe no one in this lost. city knows about them because no one yeah, in this city are. knows how this city came into existence. It is simply the extent of their universe. Red, 27. Mourned as process toll climbs. Vigil held for popular musician after she vanished in the week's catastrophic outbreak. Kind words, though. One of Cloudbank's most influential voices has gone silent amid the process epidemic spreading through the city unchecked. Red became active as a musician from a young age, though her popularity surged in recent years as her songs consistently charted in the top 10th percentile for the past five years, according to OVC data. While Red is but one of thousands of disappearances this week, thousands more gathered to honour her life and her music on the eastern perimeter as the sound of her voice cut through the darkness. None of this is coming through anymore, is it? Right. Though you still hear me, don't you? Of course. You? Of course I do. You're all I have. Red. There has to be a way to get you out of there. We'll figure it out when we get there. Yes, we will. In addition to all of that stuff that I was talking about, that I had some more points to make, but we'll move on from because I forgot what they were, um, I just want to restate that I love that... Gotta retrace our steps. Get to where you found them. Red starts out interacting with these components of her society um, in the same way as she always has done. She instinctively fills out the... Uh, democratic surveys that she's used to just instinctively doing. She talks in the comment system like she has done her whole life. And then after a certain point she realises it's pointless. No one is hearing her. No one ever will hear her again. And so she stops and she starts using it to talk to the boxer. Uh, I'll catch up with you in a second. So there's almost even an irony in viewing this as a kind of a a plague or an attack destroying the city. It is destroying what this city is, but it is doing so by returning it to its original state. It is going back to what this it was. It's theirs. Surely it was theirs to begin with. But again, no one in this world has any knowledge or understanding of that, except for the tiny handful of the Camerata. And Royce's um, investigations and understandings of that actually do fit that kind of um, tragic occult archetype of the man who saw the true shape of the universe, used that information to his own benefit, but lost control of it, toyed with forces beyond his understanding to the detriment of everybody. I'd say it's almost Lovecraftian, but I think we should move away from Lovecraft with regards to tragic, weird literature for, well, all of the reasons everybody already knows. But yeah, so one of the things I was talking about 
um, with regards to why the process is interesting is that they are this kind of fundamental structure. They are this world's electromagnetism, this world's entropy. Um, and yet, even as they render the nature of this world back into its fundamental substrate, they mimic humanity. They express a desire to become more like what humans are. As we see when they mimic the cluckers uh, mimicking human behavior, or the um, more human-like nature of the more complex forms of the uh, of the process themselves. I did not mean to switch these on, that's besides the point. So we should have unlocked this fully now. Royce Brackett, age 37, gender M. Selections, engineering and mathematics. Reasons cited, declined. Once there was a great engineer. Arithmetic was his medium and a city was his canvas. He planned the roads, the buildings and byways. His work could not be more precise. Like everyone in Cloudbank, he served at the pleasure of the city's people. The city changed, quickly and often, reconfiguring to best suit the contemporary sensibility. Thus, the engineer's work was ephemeral. He loved his craft, but he could not let himself become attached to the product of his effort. Because the engineer's work was never done, it stayed fresh. With new whims came new challenges. Bridges, gardens, towers, ports. None of it lasted very long. The nature of his work led him to notice certain patterns over time. The will of the people changed in cycles. Bridges would come down in favour of railways. Railways would give way to parks. New bridges would then be built upon the parks, and so on. Recognising this, the engineer started fashioning avant-garde structures and designs he believed would persist beyond the immediate urges of the population. Yet these ideas proved much less popular, and before much longer he became obscure. He left his job to pursue personal interests on his own. It was then that he discovered a formula visualising exactly how the structures of Cloudbank formed. He studied this formula closely, for it filled him with a deep sense of wonder and an even deeper sense of dread. He developed predictive algorithms to determine when and where the visualization would take form. He began drawing it out on his own architectural plans until one day he found it in its natural state. He saw beyond the confines of the city into something more, and there before him was something extraordinary. He took it and realized the things he now saw stood at his call. So Brackett's story is much more fairy tale, much more almost sing-song than um, the other stories we read, which read like um, almost um, book cover abbreviated narratives describing these people and their lives and what's happened to them. Did I actually even use... I must have done. <laughs> I don't remember using that in combat at all. Um, but, so... Brackett's story makes my understanding um, my inferred understanding of the text pretty much just canonically the nature of the text <laughs> like this is this is almost the plot of a of a weird horror novel after all this man observes the patterns of the universe and finds a way to manipulate it and in so doing manages to force something into existence that would not have been physical previously he learns of the way of the way the universe changes and then manipulates those changes in order to bring into existence a physical object he can interact with, which will change things the way he wants them to be changed. And that, in case you haven't guessed by now, is the transistor. Are these lower level creeps? They're not very tough. I think they must be. I guess I don't get any XP for these ones, then, because I'm not in a combat. That's curious. So, anyway, here we are, looping back around to... Hey guys, what's new? Very nearly where we started. Here we are, back at the empty set, or perhaps the emptier set, if you will, considering uh, what's happened. And again, I just want to point out that we won't be able to see and read the stories of all of the characters by the time we get through this. There are more functions than I think I can unlock on a single playthrough, and also... Um, those functions will have too few combats left in this game for them to all uh, actually happen. 
This is probably the least efficient fight I've done here. As I did say originally, I'm not like... I'm not here to min-max the combat and show you how to win the game. I'm here to talk about the they themes in the narrative, as I have been doing. A little peace and quiet. Ooh, so close to leveling up. I honestly do feel like I'm gaining XP at a much slower rate, and I'm not sure why. Did I... I don't think I left a limiter on in the other one. It's very curious. So that's it. Farewell to Cloudbank. One reporter's eyewitness account of the city's final hours. No news left to report. No one left to report it. As I stand here on the eastern perimeter, awaiting the inevitable, I am surrounded by my community and I am at peace. It has been my honour and my privilege to spread the news of the day amongst the people of this city, and my only regret is having no more time to share it with you all. To the west, I see nothing, and to the east, there is nothing, and so we wait, together, shoulder to shoulder. We will not leave our fair city under any circumstance. I suspect even the process has figured that out by now. Farewell. Everyone. How about is everyone... we get out of here? No response. So, that is going to be pretty much all from me for today, I think. Yeah, I um, I hope you join me next time for, uh, well, I think ramping up to the end game. There's not very much of it left now. So, uh, I really hope you enjoy my takes. I really hope you comment on that poll, which will be in the episode description. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one tweet micro reviews. Or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.